we've already used relative addresses and absolute addresses extensively. I had mentioned about a third kind of address called mixed address, but we haven't seen any examples of mixed addresses. In this segment, we look at mixed addresses. Okay, so we already know this. That's a completely relative address, no dollar signs. That's a completely absolute address. Both column and row are absolute. And these are two examples of mixed addresses. In this, the column is absolute. In this, the row is absolute. Right, we already know this. Now, in terms of copy and paste behavior of address types, in a relative address, we know that the row and column are both relative. When you copy and paste it, both the row and the column will change. Absolute address, both column and row are absolute. Nothing changes. The address is going to be pasted exactly as it was. In mixed addresses, the part preceded by the dollar is absolute and that will remain unchanged. The part, the other part, which is not preceded by a dollar, that is relative and that will get changed. Okay, so let's see examples of scenarios where this comes in useful. Possibly the simplest example that illustrates the need for mixed addresses is the following scenario. What we want to do is we've got these numbers here along the columns, along the rows, and what we really want to do, let's say, is to create a times table, which means that the element at a particular cell is the product of the number on the column and the number on the row. Okay, so here would be 1, there would be 2 times 1 is 2, here would be 3 times 3 is 9, and here would be, let's say, 5 times 4 is 20, and so on. Clearly, we wouldn't be using Excel to create a times table, but I think this is the simplest and the most direct possible illustration of the benefit of using mixed addresses. Okay, so treat this just as an illustration, and then we'll move on to more practical kinds of applications of mixed addresses. So in order to do this, one thing we can clearly see is that for any number, that is any cell, one of the numbers, so let's say we are considering this cell, this is this number 1 times 1, this first number is always going to be from column A, right? That is if you take any cell, let's say you're considering this cell, this is going to be 5 that is this 5 multiplied by that 3, 15, the 5 is coming from column A and the 3 is coming from row 2. Okay, For any number, right? say take this number, the 9 is going to come from column A and 8 is going to come from uh, row 2. right? So for any cell, one number is coming from column A always, one number is coming from row 2 always, and the other values will keep changing depending on the context. Okay, So first of all, let's try a very simplistic formula. We can just say equals b2, which is this, times a3, which is this. Clearly, this formula is correct for this cell, but when you copy and paste it, it goes completely haywire. Right? That is because what this is really doing is multiplying the number right above with the number just to the left. That's fine for this, but what if you come here? you're not supposed to multiply the number right above with the number to the left. Instead, you're supposed to multiply that number and that number, not the ones immediately above and to the left. Right. So this formula clearly doesn't cut it uh, so far as copying and pasting the formula is concerned. Okay. So now let's consider this. As I've already pointed out, one number will always be from row 2. Another number will always be from column A. Right. So we're going to say x multiplied by y and in one of them, the column will be always A. And in the other of them, the row will be always 2. Okay, so let's see. Here is the formula. So we're writing B dollar 2. Right, Y dollar 2. So that clearly is the this number. So we made the row absolute. The row is absolute at 2, which means we're talking about this row. Okay, and here we are saying dollar A3. Why dollar A? Well, the column is always going to be A for the second number. So this is the number from there. The second one is the number from there. Okay. So when you multiply it, obviously, you get the result 1. The beauty is when you copy it to any other cell, the relative part changes. So for example, if you're considering this cell, the relative part is the column. So now that becomes G for this particular cell. The row still remains 2. So we are now talking about this. Okay. And if you look at 
uh, what the second address turns out to the column is still a dollar a and it is still one uh, three that is that is because this was in row three so when you copy it it's still going to remain row three right because we are in the same row so relative to this it's the same row so it won't change but if you go somewhere else everything will change automatically right so to create these hundred formulas literally all we are doing is creating one single formula and just copying it everywhere. So in order to copy it, we can just first drag this over. Okay, so I'm just explaining all of these things. This is B2 times A3 and so on. So we drag it all over and then we can just drag it all the way down and that's it. We get a complete times table. Okay. So mixed addresses are very powerful in, especially in these kinds of contexts. Right. Typically, when you're multiplying something from one row with something from one column. Let us now consider a practical application of mixed addresses. So let's take this scenario. Right. Earlier, we saw what the mortgage payment is going to be for a given loan amount and for a given interest rate. Now, let's now say that we're interested in trying to find the mortgage amount, that is the monthly mortgage payment for a given loan but we want to see for various interest rates what the monthly payment comes out to be and for various repayment time periods what the monthly payment comes out to be in other words we're taking a loan of 10,000 and suppose our interest is 3% and we want to pay it off in one year okay and of course we are paying let's say monthly uh, we are making monthly payments and if you want to pay it off in one year then this would be your repayment. But what if instead of one year, I want to pay it off in two years, what would be my payment? In 10 years, what would be my payment? So we want to calculate all of these. But we also want to consider what if the interest rate is also different. In other words, I want to say, I want to uh, take a loan of 10,000. If the interest rate is 4% and I pay it off in seven years, what is going to be my monthly payment? Okay, so obviously we are going to use the PMT formula. We're going to say PMT and we've got the interest rate number of periods and loan amount. The loan amount is fixed, but these two things are going to vary depending upon which cell we're on. So for a given cell, we'll take the corresponding interest rate and the corresponding uh, repayment number of years. Okay. So once again, our goal is to write one single formula and just copy it for the entire period, for the entire matrix. Okay. So that's really what we are trying to do. This is monthly payment. So let's say that we've given names to all these cells. So D1 is named as loan okay so then the formula for this would be PMT C dollar four right why C dollar four right because uh, the dollar four is the row on which the interest rate is that's going to be fixed that's uh, you know the, the row on which the interest rate is that is in the fourth row so that is fixed but the column is going to change as we move for uh, you know, for the different interest rates. Okay, so when you want to consider the interest rate, it's going to be, you know, C dollar four, D dollar four, uh, E dollar four, etc. But the four is fixed. The fourth row is fixed, divided by twelve. So because we do interest rate divided by twelve, now dollar B five, because dollar B because the time periods are all only in column B. Okay, so that is going to remain fixed, but five the row is going to change because the different time periods are in different rows okay so c4 c dollar 4 divided by 12 dollar b5 multiplied by 12 and the loan amount itself which is what this is okay uh, and of course i made it minus pmt instead of putting the minus on loan i put the minus on pmt so it comes out as a positive figure okay ideally i should have isolated the 12 also and said uh, number of payments per time period and I should have had 12 there and you know so that the 12 would not figure actually in the formula right ideally we shouldn't be doing that uh, the reason I put 12 in there is most of the time we are going to be calculating mortgage payments for monthly payments right that is fairly standard so I didn't isolate that I just kept it in the formula but it might still be a good idea to isolate that also right so this one formula is all we need you can copy it and you see the whole thing, right? So if you had a 3% interest rate and you paid it off in one year, you would be paying $846. 
But if you had a 3% interest rate and you paid it off in 10 years, your monthly payment is only $100, $95.56 and so on. Okay, so here you can examine for the same time period, what is the impact of the interest rate? And for the same interest rate, what is the impact of changing the time period? You get an idea of both of these things. So this is a practical context in which mixed addresses really benefit us. With just one single formula, we are able to complete, com compute an entire table.